Welcome everyone to another episode of the Living Large Podcast. Today I have with me someone who, like me, has a passion for growing flowers. And I'm so excited to chat with Catherine from Fancy Flower Girls. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Lynn. Thanks for having me on your show. You're very welcome. Thanks for being here. Can you share with everybody a little bit about yourself and where you live? Sure. So my name is Catherine uh, Kachowski, and I live in Palatine. And I actually am a full-time working mom in IT. Um, I have a wonderful husband and two beautiful girls. Um, and I'm very, very lucky to um, be in a position where I can grow flowers. Um, and so I am the proud founder and owner of Fancy Flower Girls. Well, and we don't we don't know each other. This is the first time we've met face to face, but we have a mutual acquaintance, the editors. And I believe that's where I discovered you because they were either talking about you or you were um, doing something with them. But yeah, that's how I I found you. And we're in na- we we live in neighboring neighborhoods in Illinois. Yes, yeah, the editors are fantastic, and they're the it couple in Palatine. I would say these days, <laughs> um, they, they're gonna laugh when they hear that. But um, they're yeah. the sweetest guys, and I actually met them when I brought some sunflowers over there um, last year. I had uh, I had actually the first time I saw them was from one of their Christmas videos where Nathan dressed up as Elf and we just oh, laughed nice. and laughed um, with that one. It was fabulous. And so um, I had been following them for a little while and found out that they love flowers. So I thought it would be a great introduction just to bring over some flowers and for, for everyone to enjoy the beauty that they are. And um, they love them. And so um, I've been fortunate enough um, that they've asked for me to work with them on a few events that they've had. Um, mm-hmm. And it's so fun um, you know, to have the freedom to work with local flowers and um, just the freedom to do floral design as well. So it's been really fun to do those events with them. Yeah, I met them on Instagram, you know, meeting people on Instagram. I met them on Instagram several years ago and I've actually been to their house a couple of times. One time was like a little, they gave me a little mini garden tour because we do both love flowers too. And um, another time they were on my podcast and my daughter and I went to their house and we did it live from their, the editor's basement. Oh, so, oh it's yeah. beautiful in their house. Just immaculate. Yeah. And their and the house is amazing. Amazing. Yeah. And they're, they're just so genuinely amazing human beings. I just love both of them so much. So, um, and another little fun fact, I actually, my husband grew up in Palatine his whole life and I moved to the area when I was a freshman in high school and we both graduated from Fremd High School. So about that, yeah. my girls will really? go to them. So will they, oh, will girl. they? <laughs> yeah. So Tell us a story about how Fancy um, Flower Girls came to be. So it was 2020 happened. and When everything happened. <laughs> it, boom, right? And, and 2020 happened and everyone's world just got kind of flipped upside down. Up until that point in my IT career, I had always been in the office full time. Um, and that that's life, right? That's That's the life that we were leading. And then all of a sudden we found ourselves home, right? Kind of nervous, right? Not wanting to really leave the vicinity of home. And I was actually four months pregnant at that time with my second. And so for me as a pregnant woman, um, there's even more emotions and um, right. you know concern that came with that whole time. And so um, as the year progressed, I had a beautiful baby girl and um, healthy, beautiful, perfect. And um, then the winter months hit. And I found myself dreaming about flowers um, because when the winter is here and it's cold and frozen outside and you, you know, below zero, you really don't want to be venturing out. So I found myself dreaming about flowers and planting flowers and knowing that I would have a young family, um, you know, for the foreseeable future, right? I wanted to be able for us to enjoy being together and, and trying out new things. So in 2021, um, I launched my Facebook page 
um, started growing some flowers outside and said, hey, maybe I'm spending so much money. Maybe I can, you know, get a little money back, right? And and um, cut some flowers and have neighbors enjoy them, friends, families. So I created a Facebook page and I just invited um, the people that I knew. And um, very quickly by the end of 2021, um, I had a wonderful mom post on a local Facebook moms page about my business and it just blew up overnight. Um, and so my, my growth and my um, credit really goes, all of my marketing um, has been my customers and my customer base and in the local community um, and the surrounding suburbs. And so I'm very appreciative of that. Um, you know, for me, growing flowers is a joy. Um, we may, we are trying to figure out what to name the business. And so we said, well, I have two girls and flowers are fancy. So fancy flower girls um, is how it came to be. Um, and so really as a mom entrepreneur um, and uh, you know, full-time working in IT, I wanna show my girls that they can do anything. And so you know, follow your passions, do what you love, Find, a, find something that somebody hasn't done before and do it, right? There's no one that can hold you back and tell you no, um, you know, to always try and dream. And really that's why it started. It's, it's something that I can not only do for myself as a mom to just get outside, but not be too far away, right? To, to have right. a space and a passion. But then as the girls are growing, um, my little one loves anything with water. She will water all of your plants for you if you need them to be watered, uh, any water play. And then the older one is just, she's starting to love seeds and planting seeds and the different flowers. And she can say ranunculus. Both of my kids know how to say ranunculus and lisianthus. So these are just flowers that are not typically found here, right? So right, it's really right. fun to learn about flowers, the different varieties, and just trial and error, right? Um, and so it's been a real learning process. I've never been an outdoors girl and um, camping or otherwise no bugs, you know? And I just released, uh, we just released 1500 ladybugs about a month ago in our garden. and ask me if I ever would have seen me do that like five years ago and the answer yeah. is no um so just wait because they you will have them everywhere even in your house very soon <laughs> oh my gosh well the good ones can stay the the, yeah. the there are a bad variety um the Asian beetle kind that that you don't mm -hmm. want invasive. right but actually the the ladybug kind um they actually don't prefer in your house which is interesting so through through joining countless Facebook groups, talking to other flower growers in the area that I had no idea even existed before I started doing this research. And then just looking at the seed catalogs of the hundreds and thousands of varieties of flower seeds that you can buy and grow, my flower world just completely blew up and I'm obsessed. Yeah. Uh, I love it. I wanna try to grow every single flower um, and see if it works for us. So we're on this journey of discovery and um, this year I've coined as the year of opportunity. So um, kind of going after networking opportunities, talking to people like you um, and just expanding our, our networking capabilities, I think is uh, really the focus of this year is the opportunities that are here. So it's been a wild journey, um, and and I never thought I would ever be doing something like this, but here we are. Well, and that kind of leads me into my next question because I would have assumed that you lit, you know, to be think come up with the idea of being a flower farmer, um, as it were. I kind of assumed that you maybe lived on a farm or had a bunch of acreage. But I've seen pictures and it appears that you're in a pretty typical suburban Palatine neighborhood. Yes. Um, yep. So are there flower beds everywhere? So um, we moved into our house about six or seven years ago, and it was a new build with sod up to the house that was burning. Mm -hmm. um, and it just looked awful. And so the over the years, we've been slowly chipping away and adding in landscaping. And as we add landscaping, I've added lots of perennials, 
but then I also started focusing on cut flowers, right? So flowers that would be good in a vase that I could bring inside and we could enjoy, enjoy inside and outside. Um, when we bought the house, we didn't know um, that there was a, uh, well, we knew that there was a side yard next to a small walking path that goes in between four houses. And um, we were told that that wasn't part of our lot. And then um, over time, we found out actually um, Palatine had deeded those properties off to the respective owners. So we did own it, um, but we couldn't build anything on it. So um, when we were looking at a fence, that was going to be somewhat of a challenge. Um, and so we decided to get some privacy and do more of a natural landscape. So we started adding in trees was the first real um, piece. Um, and so we added in the layout for the trees and then slowly but surely we started adding flower boxes. Um, so as part of COVID um, time, we started focusing on house upgrades, which I know a lot of people did, uh, you know, to improve your, your home life because you're there a lot, right? Um, and so we got a new deck. And so we used the wood from our prior deck to build all the flower boxes. Um, so we're reusing some of the resources that we mm -hmm. already had. Um, and I said, you know, hey, honey, we have extra wood. Can we add another flower box? And that's kind of how that happened. Um, and, and he even said, hey, we have some more wood. Do you need another flower box? And it's, oh, you're, you're winning. You're winning today. Um, and so, husband of the year. And so um, he, you know, me and him, we built the flower boxes and we just started adding landscaping. And so um, it, it's organically growing. Um, have I stopped expanding our yard? I don't want to say I've stopped because uh, we'll see what happens uh, in the future. But this year we did add in a rose garden. So that was the new introduction this year, the investment that we made. Um, and when all is said and done, um, maybe not done, but uh, in the spring um, of next year, I'll probably have about 40 to 45 roses that we've planted on our property. Um, so we're uh, adding in those beautiful perennials and then the flower boxes we really used for annuals like seeds, um, mm -hmm. as well as anything that you need to dig up like dahlias. Um, so anything that doesn't really like clay soil, that's the stuff that goes into all of our flower boxes. But we've got about, I want to say it's a little bit more than 500 square feet of actual growing space um, on our property. And then we have pockets of landscaping that I try to tuck plants in as well. Yeah, my gardens are pretty extensive too. Um, most, you know, the whole I would say perimeter of our, our property is perennial beds. But then I started my cutting garden just two years ago, but I've been gardening my whole life. I just couldn't keep up with the deer eating mm -hmm. out of my perennial beds. So that's the cutting garden is fenced in in my vegetable garden. But have you, have you thought about potentially moving to a larger more rural type of an environment it's probably a bit of a dream yeah so when we bought our house we said we wanted to choose the best house in the best neighborhood best schools right so we've landed here and I, I believe this will be our forever home but I have been pondering um having maybe an off-site growing space um for certain perennials someday um, which would definitely be um, an investment that we would need to make down the line. But um, that is a possibility. Um, looking at the current structure of my business model, it's me who's mm -hmm. doing most of the gardening. Um, and my my husband really is watching the kids, right? So somebody's got to take uh -huh. care of it. it. It takes a village, right, to, to make things happen. And um, I also have been fortunate enough to have found some wonderful interns this year. And so when I was really hitting a lot of, um, a lot of work uh, came into when the tulips bloomed all at the same time this year, which wasn't expected. Um, I had wonderful interns that I recruited and who come by, um, spend an hour or two with me on a task, or if they already know how to do a task and I'm on calls for work, they'll be out there in the afternoon, you know, kind of helping me keep up with things. So um, while I don't have any set employees right now, um, that is also, you know, potential for the future so that I can um, run a business. 
have a full-time job and uh, also do have all my other tests I have to do in life. So, um, but yeah, I've, I've been thinking about that. I don't know if farm life will ever be a life for us. We're, we're very suburban, I would say, in, in certain <laughs> ways. Um, but definitely looking at pockets of um, land or rental space, et cetera, um, for the future, that's definitely not out of the question. We're just not there yet. One of the things that I'm going to do in my neighborhood is start a community garden where people can pay to have a plot or two or three or whatever they want. And um, I was potentially thinking of putting my cutting garden in there too. So yeah, I mean, there's you never have enough room for all, all the flowers. Um, there's the so next thing I was, <laughs> yeah. so many the next I was gonna ask you, but I think I know just so far from our, our conversation, you don't really have formal training in agriculture or flower growing. You just are learning as you go and trial and error. And I think passion is probably the best motivator for us to learn some of these amazing skills because I didn't have any gar I didn't have any gardening skills when I started. It was total trial and error. I'm still learning. I'm still yes, all the time. And, issues. and my I mean, I've only been doing this for a few years. Um, my I think I learned my organization, my layout um, from my mom. My mom is very particular on the flowers that she grows. And it's funny because she's a more orange, red, yellow. Uh, she loves those color combinations. I lean more towards the pink and purples. Um, it's just kind of what I, I, I kind of just lean toward that. So it's really great to get different perspectives on different colors because I have customers who love all colors, right? Right. But my mom's, uh, her landscaping has always been very meticulous where the flowers go. She's very particular about the color and what flowers she uses and taking care of them. And so I really, I, I started learning that from her. And then I think my obsession from flowers just, it, it gradually grew, organically grew, I guess, if you could say, um, from the time when I was in dance and I got my dance bouquets for recitals. And then my husband quickly figured out when we were dating that I love flowers. So he would get me flowers and it would make me happy. Um, and um, one, one interesting note to make is one time he gave me flowers and he left a note that said, you know, I'm giving these flowers to brighten your day. Maybe someday we'll have a garden of our own where you can grow your own flowers. Little did he know that it was going to turn into this. Um, All right, so there you go. <laughs> yeah, you, I mean, I think that's a great one to hold over his head if there's ever an issue with them. Um, too many, too much time in the flower garden. Yeah. Oh yeah, but yeah, I think it it really like my love for flowers and my passion for flowers, and then I saw what a dahlia looked like. Um, just a picture of huh. that. And I just became obsessed. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a heartbreaking story to tell you, but let's start talking about some of the, the flowers that you grow. Sure. Um, and let's start off with spring. Like what is, obviously tulips are the first thing that comes up in your garden. Yes. Yeah, so I grow um, tulips, but not the kind that you'll find at the grocery store. I'm growing the double tulips and the parrot tulips that are huge. I never knew before I grew tulips for cut flowers that tulips have a smell. There are actually tulips that have a smell. And there's a, there's a kind that I found that actually has a lemon scent, which is amazing. Ooh. Um, I think it's called Francione, I think is how you pronounce it, but it's, it's, it's fantastic. So I'm definitely growing those next year. Um, and so I started the first year I did, I started with a thousand bulbs. Last year I did 2,000 bulbs. This year I will be planting 4,000 tulip bulbs in the fall. Um, and so- Yikes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> when bloom, it's gonna be a sight to see. Um, but funny enough, I actually felt like I didn't have enough this year and I had 2,000 of them. So we're upping our game um, for next spring. So um, whoever loves tulips, be on the lookout for tulips uh, with us. Um, but 
it starts with the tulips. They're fabulous. Um, and then I get daffodils. Um, then we move into some a little bit more harder flowers to grow, which are ranunculus and anemones. Um, so I have those um, come after and then peonies. Uh, my peonies are babies. Um, so I actually recruited for peonies this year and I had um, some neighbors and customers reach out to me offering up peony cut flower peonies. I was amazed. I mean, it literally, I've had people drop off buckets of flowers at my door, um, which is just amazing. I mean, what kind of world is this where they drop off flowers at the florist, right? Um, but it's just, it's amazing um, the, the support that I've gotten. And so, um, you know, that, that's, that's been awesome. And so then it goes with the peonies. And then right now we're, we're in Snapdragon time, uh, Snapdragon and roses. Um, the roses that I planted in the spring are starting to bloom. They're not quite ready to be cut yet for, for cut flowers, but mm -hmm. I'm hopeful that either toward the end of this year, maybe even, you know, early next year, we'll hopefully get some more roses because those are beautiful. Um, and then the dahlias. Um, so I just started having some dahlias bloom. I'll be having sunflowers. And then I also have lisianthus. So those are flowers that are to come later this year. I planted Lisianthus last year for the first time from seed, which is extremely difficult to grow from seed. Um, but I did get some, planted them, thought I killed them about three times, you know, and you're like, well, if you can survive my neglect, then I will plant you. Um, so I planted them and they bloomed and I wished that I had millions of them because they are just incredible. Um, and, and the way that they hold up, I actually cut one, left it on the ground for a week outside in the elements, came back. It looked like I had just cut it. I brought it inside, gave it a little snip and it lasted for two more weeks. So these oh are like God. indestructible flowers, incredible. Um, and so now I'm growing hundreds of them this year. Um, so it should be definitely a sight to see um, toward the end of, end of this year. So now with your tulips, when you're planting 4,000 bulbs, that's taking up a lot of space. Are you digging up those bulbs after they're done or are you leaving them in the ground? Yeah. For so next? How, are you, how are you managing that? Because I have a friend, I don't know if you follow her, Kim from Shiplaps and, and Shells. Oh, I don't. I don't oh, follow her yet, but she's I know. one. She's yeah. one to follow. She has the most fabulous gardens and she's on the Pacific in the Pacific Northwest, which they have the best weather for flowers. They just yeah. have such a great growing um, growing area. But she puts tulips in all of her beds and they come up and they're beautiful. And then she digs them all up and then plants her flowers after that. So I was curious what you did here in our zone. Yeah, so for us, um, we'll you know push off all the dirt plant them all together. So I'm not going to dig 4,000 holes because that's just right, great. Right. So I do like a, like almost like a batch uh, planting. Yes. And so I'll plant them. And then once they come up and they bloom for cut flowers, you actually pull up the entire tulip by the bulb. And then you get like a good six inches, at least more of um, stem length, uh -huh. which is great. Or vase. Right. And then what you do with the bulb is you actually discard it. So when you grow tulips for cut flowers, you treat the tulip bulbs like annuals. Um, okay. You just pitch the bulb. Now, um, I do have many tulips in my landscaping that I leave and are a leave in, and then they naturalize and they come back and they multiply. Um, you know, uh, throughout the year, and then they'll bloom again in the in the next spring. But for the beds, I dig up everything because what I, what I'm doing in there is I'm I'm constantly turning over the beds. Once the tulips come out, then it's Mother's Day, and then the dahlias go in. Um, and so then the dahlias go in in mid May, and then I plant out my seedlings so they have space to grow. So all of those bulbs get dug up um, every every year. Um, and so the four thousand one's going to be even trickier, but I, I can fit about 2000 bulbs in each of my big beds. And so I'm just going to plant, you know, two and 2000 and 2000 in, in each of the beds next year. Um, and then once they bloom, as they bloom, we'll dig them out. Um, you can actually, if you get the bulb attached, you can actually store that tulip for a period of time in a cooler um, and you don't have to use it right away. 
So um, that it's a tricky situation to do that and they haven't mastered it quite yet. Um, so I prefer to, to dig it up and then snip and then it goes right into an arrangement. Um, but if I'm planning for an event or something and I've, I've got a whole pink tulips or they really want yellow or whatever mm -hmm. the case may be, there is an opportunity to hold them for a short period of time um, with the bulb attached because that's the food source. So as long as, as long as it has that, it should be good. Do you know the trick about saving um, peonies for an event? You can dry store them. For yeah, a couple I months, actually. Yeah, I just found it out luckily enough right before my daughter's wedding, and we did a back. She had two weddings, one during COVID in our backyard, and the, then we had one that I fondly refer to as the party, which was <laughs> a year later. But we did. I, my peonies are so pretty early on. And I found that if I got them when they were like almost like a marshmallow consistency and I wrapped them up in um, paper towel, put them in my refrigerator and they lasted till June, till her wedding. And amazing? yeah, it was amazing. I had all these years and I'm like, who knew that I could prolong those peonies for that long, which was luck. We, we got lucky because we had a flower debacle with her wedding, but I'll tell you about that in a second. Cause I want to ask you, since we're talking about the actual flowers, you don't start all of them from seed, but you do start some of them from seed. Yeah, so a large majority, I would say over 90%, maybe even more, um, I actually start uh, from seed or bulb or tuber or, Bear right. Right, whatever, right? Um, there are a portion of plants that and flowers, types of flowers that I just don't think grow very well here, especially without a greenhouse. So one of them is eucalyptus. So unless you have a greenhouse, a eucalyptus is a very slow growing plant. I've tried growing it from seed and my, my little eucalyptus plants this year are about this big um, compared to the beauties that you see. So um, some of the plants that I'll buy and will buy from a local nursery and then I will plant them in my flower beds and let them continue to grow from there. Um, for Lysianthus, again, very difficult to start from seed. So I do have about half to 60% I have started from seed. I had a really great year um, this year when I started them and they're growing out there, but I did want to make sure that I had enough for everyone. And so what I did was I bought some plugs. Um, so I had plugs delivered, planted those out. Those are beautifully growing along with the rest of the uh, crop out there. So there's just some things that um, I prefer to, to purchase and plant out, but uh, but I would say at least 90 or more, um, I actually start from seed. So my uh, my seed starting starts in December, believe it or not, for the following year. Um, so I was just gonna say, you must have quite the production going on inside over the winter because I have never started from seed until this past year. And I did, and I, did, I didn't start soon enough. Um, I learned some lessons. I, I didn't start till February. And I also needed to, there's a lot of things I should have transplanted into a bigger container right away. Um, I did not have any luck with the ranunculus. I got nothing from that. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and the, the, the how, do, how do you pronounce it? The Lysantis. I, I didn't get anything from those seeds. Um, I have, I had a few things, I, I got a lot of seeds from Florette, so mm -hmm. some very different kind of things that I would never put in my garden, and then there were some that said they should be just sown as soon as you can put them in the ground, so I put them in the ground, had everything marked real lovely, and we have chickens, and my husband forgot to close the gate on the garden and the chickens got in there and did their feather bath thing in this dirt. So and how, nothing but weeds is coming up because I kind of left it to see if flowers would grow. And I, I've got a few, but mostly weeds because I didn't want to touch anything till I saw it came up. But yeah, what a mess. Oh, no. And you know, I, I don't have deer, 
which is one thing that I'm very happy with. And I don't have chickens, um, but I have rabbits. Um, and if you try to grow sunflowers, they are attracted to that like Fannie Mae. I mean, and so they will just take care of it. Um, there's been times when I plant the sunflower seeds and they're growing great. And then I'll come out the next day and they will all be like little sticks in the ground. Mm -hmm. Rabbits just ate them. And the problem with that is the types of sunflowers I grow are single stem. Um, and so that means one seed equals one bloom. And so if you eat the top off, nothing's going to happen. That yeah. thing is a goner. And so I was disappointing last year because I did get sunflowers in the first part of the year and I was planning to have sunflowers in the fall and then the rabbits got to that garden and we didn't have as many sunflowers as we had hoped. So, um, you know, for working with, I guess, local flowers, it's difficult to commit that far in advance on anything, right? Because right. Right. The, the, you know, right? The next day, the rabbit or the chicken or the deer just completely, you know, demolish your crop. Um, and then you've got to switch gears. So what I prefer to do is like, if I have an event um, coming up, like let's say in the fall, and they're really looking for pinks, right? Okay. I will promise you pinks, right? In this range of colors, right? But I can't promise you specific flowers because I just don't know what to do well. I can't promise specific Dahlia variety. Like I'm not going to do that, right? But we can promise a look. And so then what I'll do is, especially if it's a big event, like a wedding or something, I'll have um, the bride um, come out, you know, three weeks before their wedding. Then they can see everything that's blooming. What do you like? We'll put together a mock-up, right? And then you can really get an idea of what flowers are actually going to be in your arrangements or your um, or for your uh, bouquets. And then it's very helpful, you know, it's for, for me. And then it's also helpful for them too, because, and it's fun because what I've had happen is brides would be like, I have this very specific look in mind. And then when they right. come and see flowers, they say, oh, actually, that's what I love. It's completely different color than what they told me before. And I'm like, you know what, as long as it's growing in my garden, it's yours. Yeah, right. It's yours. Um, and yeah. so that's always, it's always really fun to walk the garden and put together a mock-up arrangement um, and then send it on its way, you know, so they can put it on their table and look at it from all angles and let me know what they think. So um, it's, that's been really fun to get to work with people who are open like that, but it is a challenge though, when you uh, get very specific requests, especially for blue flowers is another one. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. There, there's not a lot of blue flowers. No, there are not. And I actually have, I should have tucked some in this. It would have looked pretty, but um, I actually have forget me nots blooming right now, which are blue. Um, and I have a pink version, a purple version as well, but those are they bloom. You have no idea when they're going to bloom and I can't promise it. But this past weekend, there was a baby shower for a boy. She had asked for blue and I said, well, I don't have any blue. And then just by sheer luck, the blue flowers bloomed for the baby shower. So I got to put blue flowers in. Oh, very cool. Cool. I had delphiniums, which I've tried to grow for years and years and years and years, and they just never have luck, but I've been persistent and I haven't given up. And I planted them last year, they bloomed and they came back and this is the first year. And so they, they're bigger, they were, they yeah. lasted longer, had more blooms. Um, I was pretty excited about that. And they were, right now there's still um, delphiniums and my bee balm is in front of it and my Shasta daisies are next to it. And it's all, look, I've got one little corner and the deer don't like that. So I have oh, good. one corner. Yeah, I battle deer like crazy. I'm out there with my deer off. I found that it's it works way better than any other kind. I shave Irish spring soap all over the place. I have one of those things called a, I think it's called a scarecrow that it's a motion sensor that squirts water at them. Yeah. yeah. And they, the other night I took our dog out at four o'clock in the morning and there's the deer just staring right at me. Like, I dare you to come get me because I'm having my breakfast in your yard, oh but I don't have, I don't have bunnies. So Wow. there's that but I do you know the squirrels like my sunflowers and I started sunflowers from seed 
And that was a mistake because they grow so well. I mean, from seed inside, they oh, grow yeah. so well just putting seeds in the ground. And I already have flowers on those ones that I started way back in whenever, March, February, March. And the squirrels are up on top. And of course, then everything gets kind of decimated in, in my yard from them. Well, actually, so seeds out of the inside. Yep. Um, yep. Actually, there was a, um, I, I was worried about the tulips because I grow so many of them. And I have a garden in the back, which I refer to as my sacrificial garden. And mm -hmm. I don't put any netting or anything around it. And I'm like, buffet for you, right? Like go over there. It's, on the, it's on the back side of my property that's uh, on the opposite side of my side yard where I grow all my beds. And um, when I grew the thousand tulips, I did not protect them. I did not put anything around the sides of them, any bunny fencing or anything. They were untouched those tulips but the ones that I had planted in the sacrificial garden were just decimated I mean the tops were chopped off and you know they were having mm -hmm. a and so just very interesting kind of um you know if you're gonna grow flowers and you don't want them to touch certain flowers perhaps on a different side you know get them to go over there right like this is your yeah. birthday come back over here I'll plant all the things that you like here right um and it might get them to move that way but I actually use my um sacrificial garden as the sunflower patch as well so now they're probably really confused <laughs> but I do right. protect that because I, I really want sunflowers this year yeah they, they I mean they literally there's a family that literally lives across the street in a wooded area and even I, I'm sacrificing my entire yard because they don't there's nothing else for them to eat which is, it's sad. They're, they're hungry, but I hate that they're eating my plants. Yeah. Um, what about pests? Do you have any issues with certain bugs and certain things? And what is some of your advice for that? Yeah, great question. So um, bad bugs keeps me up at night. That's yeah. what wake me up at three in the morning. And I'm like, <laughs> hey, it's they're on my, you know, ranunculus. Oh my gosh, right? Or the thrips or whatever. Um, so there's, I've I've been going through a cycle this year. Last year I used a lot of pesticides. I tried to use ones that were friendly for kids mm -hmm. and uh, pets and things like that. But when you're looking to sell flowers and your flowers have holes in them, you can't sell the whole right. flower. At least not those kind, right? And so um, the problem is, you know, I had to resort to to spraying. This year, I'm I've been really adamant and I've been really focused on trying to use beneficial insects. And so um, I have jumped on the bandwagon, bought live bugs, right? Not a bug girl, bought live bugs to release in the garden to try to see if they can help the garden naturally, right? for the wonderful Japanese beetles that have arrived. Um, I, I've been seeing them on my roses. Um, they have arrived. I put down milky spore in the spring um, to try to prevent uh, the more Japanese beetles from being on my lawn. Now, are they gonna come from my neighbor's lawn or the other neighbor's lawn? Yeah, we're in the suburbs, right? There's not much that you can really do. But um, hopefully, you know, by introducing the beneficials, and by taking some of these measures, it reduces some of the population. Um, for, you know, for my beneficials this year, what I learned is I need to start beneficials earlier than I did. So by the time I released them, some of the crops that I had were ready starting to see some impact from all the bad bugs that were out there. Mm -hmm. um, so by bad bugs, I refer to like the aphids or the thrips, which are very hard to see. Um, and so, you know, compared to a commercial grower who's growing flowers, even internationally, they're using a lot of pesticides. I mean, even the flowers coming in at the ports are getting fumigated and they're just, you know, there's a lot of pesticides that are on flowers that you're buying from the store, right? So, you know, as a, I've had people ask me, do you use pesticides? Like, you know, I prefer, you know, natural flowers and I get that, right? But 
But the difference is, do you want a flower with holes in it or not, right? So I've been really trying to do those beneficials, um, keep my any kind of pesticides or anything um, at an organic level and or not doing it at all, right? I don't think I've sprayed at all this year um, because I don't want to kill my beneficials. I just paid for it and put it in my garden. Um, but when I go out there, I'm happy because I take a look at the roses and I see all these little beneficials uh, floating out there. I actually just made a post today with a little beneficial on a rose floating out there. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you're yeah, great. I saw That's that. You stay well, around. So when, when, you, when you say beneficials, like what do you, what kind of beneficial bugs are you getting? Sure. Yeah. So ladybugs, big time beneficials. Uh, ladybug larvae, which are like the uh, youth stage of a ladybug, even more. They even eat more than ladybugs do. So ladybugs are fantastic. Um, we release them in the garden and they hide underneath the leaves. So every once in a while I see them and I'm very happy. Um, you can get the praying mantis are wonderful for the garden as well. They do not discriminate between a good bug and a bad bug though. So they will eat bees, they will eat butterflies, they will eat other things. So, but they are very good for keeping numbers down in the garden. Um, so if you see a praying mantis, it's a, it's, supposed to be a good sign that your garden is in, in good shape and, and mm -hmm. um, also we've released um, something called uh, predatory insects which are uh, like predatory wasps so they're they're small tiny bugs that are not attracted to humans they're not going to come and attack you or sting you really or anything like that um, but they're small and so what they do is they go after aphids um, and so they go after aphids. There's other um, different kinds of mites that you can buy that fight bad mites. So, I mean, when you get into the whole insect and the garden, um, the different garden environment, you know, bugs and how they interact, it's very interesting. It opened up a whole new world to me this year, just doing some of this research. And I'm at the very start of that research um, from what everybody's published, but a lot of people were really talking about beneficials as a way to get away from pesticides, which was very interesting to me. So I figured I would try that out this year. Yeah, I'm I'm big on not spraying my flowers and my vegetables either. Um, and I've got something that's munching on my cabbage and my um, broccoli. And I read, I think it was in the fa Farmer's Almanac that if you go out there in the morning and sprinkle rye flour on them that mm. it will um whatever it is and whatever they were talking about it's definitely what I have because they turn into white moths and I can see the little white moths all over that area wow. and it dehydrates them the flower does because you put it on kind of when they're a little dewy and then it dehydrates these things and I thought it was working because the new growth was coming up with no holes in it but oh. today I was out there this morning and darn it, if they're not, I don't know if, if I should, if I should sprinkle again and hope for the best, or if I need to just resort to something that is helpful, but not like more organic. So yeah. um, there's a, yeah. you know, what would be really good. Um, take a look at a company called nature's good guys. They are the uh, company that I sourced my ladybugs from and a couple of my other beneficials from. And what they do is they actually, um, you can sort by what your problem is. So if you're growing, and I don't do vegetables, so I can't give a lot of advice for that. But if you sort and say, you know, there's you know, ones that fight um, uh, caterpillars, right, which might be mm -hmm. a, a lot of holes, right? Um, there's, you know, different beneficials. You can buy the, the, the caterpillar pack or caterpillar fighting pack, right? <laughs> and then they'll, they'll literally send you bugs in the mail, which is kind of gross, but it's like bugs and then bug eggs. And they give you instructions on where to place them and how to put them. And then you just let them do their thing. And now it's not going to be maybe an immediate result, but um, from what I've seen so far, it does, they, they do stick around. Uh, some of mine right. have stuck around. So I'm seeing some good uh, effects from that. But if you wanted to try that out or at least get them and start just 
build those insects in your garden, those good insects, it might be a good start this year, something to try. Yeah, that's a good idea because they do, I, I noticed when I released ladybugs in my garden, it hasn't been years since I've done it. They stuck around and they multiplied and we had a lot of ladybugs for a very long time. So it's probably time for me to look into that again too. There you go. So you for our- Make sure they don't get in your house. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you know. With chickens and dogs, who knows how everything gets in our house? It's crazy, and a and a husband who's outside tinkering on something all the time. Um, so, what would you say would be the easiest, the best flower to grow in our zone, which is B five? Um, and what is the hardest, or your, or the one you've had the most failures with? So, I would say for anyone who's like starting out. The, the staples are going to be zinnias, number one, uh, sunflowers, but you're going to get bunny pressure. So you got to watch that. There, there's tricks for that. And then cosmos are probably the first three to start from seed that I would recommend. That, those are actually the ones that I started the, the first year we started trying mm -hmm. flowers. Um, and the zinnias will just boom and they will keep booming. They're the cut and come again, right? The more you cut, the more they'll bloom, right? So you just keep cutting them and bringing them inside and enjoying them. The hardest flowers to grow are going to be the um, ranunculus, anemones, the lysianthus. Uh, dahlias are also divas. They are very divas just because of all the care that they're going to need. And you're going to have to dig them up and store them and you can't leave them outside. Um, but ranunculus and anemones are the same way. They actually, you've got to dig up the corms. You can use them again. They multiply. Um, and so those are the hardest to try. They also take the longest lead time. So those are the ones that uh, I started in December. Eventually, uh, I think I'm getting my first lysianthus buds and it is July. Um, and so maybe they'll bloom in July or August, but they take the longest uh, lead time to bloom, but they're just so pretty that you can't not grow them. So that's why I do. Yeah, it's interesting. As long as I've been gardening, I never, I never had zinnias until last year. And it, they were the easiest things to grow and they were prolific. And all I did was scatter the seeds in the ground and just kind of brushed them in there a little bit, put some water on them and voila, I, they, they're amazing. So I guess maybe I was scared, scared away from them because like you, I'm not really an orange and yellow person. And I thought that they, that in my mind, that's what I thought of zinnias, but they're all kinds of beautiful colors. Oh my gosh, um, so many from, colors and yeah. varieties. And there's actually groups out there of people who are breeding zinnia varieties. Um, Florette actually just posted their update for their zinnias, um, which is gonna be amazing. I'm gonna go after some of those seeds for sure. Um, but the uh, there's people out there who are breeding these zinnias and these groups on Facebook. So it's just, it's a whole community um, with zinnias and they're just beautiful. I mean, the size varies from size of a quarter, to, you know, to, to this big, right? And you can have right. big fluffy uh, uh, zinnia. So this year, I actually, I thought it was a good year to let the girls have their own garden in the fancy flower girls gardening space. So I gave them a piece up of the, of the garden over there and we're growing zinnias. So we've got zinnias in their garden that is fenced in. And then we've got two tomato plants because my daughter loves tomatoes. So we decided to grow some tomatoes. So we are, I guess, growing some vegetables this year. Some vegetables. I, I actually am taking a little, I, I have a few tomato plants outside of my vegetable garden because I, I tried rotating and I was still getting something and I needed to give my garden just a break from the tomatoes. For yeah. a season, but I'm a bit, I can on my, I have, I love tomatoes, but back to the flowers, dahlias. Let's talk about dahlias because they're probably one of my favorite garden flowers. Um, and they are a little finicky. And I will tell you my, this is my sad story. Last year when they needed to be, when they, the tubers needed to be dug up, 
I was really busy inside. I was doing an eight week, eight week makeover challenge in one of the rooms in our house. Wow. And it went from like mid September to the end of, no, of November, something like that. But when I wasn't working on my blog or wasn't working on the other things that I do during the day at night, when Keith would come home, we'd be working on this room. So I totally missed getting my dahlia bulbs out of my ground. And it, and it was just heartbreaking. It's just heartbreaking. <laughs> um, so anyway. Have you planted any this year? I have. I have. And they're coming up beautifully. I ordered them from a company out in Washington and they came really, really early. And so by the time I got them in the ground, some of the tubers did not look that great and they they did not all survive so I was a little disappointed with that but the ones that are up are beautiful um but I learned something from you the other day on Instagram when you were tearing off the leaves on the bottom because that makes so much sense give them some air they are they turn into big huge plants um and so I've been out there and I've given them all a nice haircut on the bottom okay. and it, it looks nicer and that it's mullet just trimmed up, you know, and get to get the bottom <laughs> you cut off. Yeah. I've got my little dahlia trees out there now after doing all that exercise. And then I I've been meaning to post and will be posting the next version, but I'll give you a sneak peek. So um, what I actually ended up doing is being kind of ruthless and I uh, topped all my flowers. So some people call it topping, some people call it pinching. Um, so I've been, but what happens is the dahlia grows and it's like a broomstick, right? It's like this thick and it's a broomstick up and dahlias naturally branch. So when you cut them, just like zinnias, um, when you cut them, they do offshoots, right? That, that create more flowers. That's what you want, right? Um, more, the more flowers, the better. And so um, what I did yesterday at lunch, and I was a bit ruthless. I went out there and I took my snips and I just cut a lot of the dahlia broomsticks in half of the plant. It's halved. And so what that'll do is that'll force the two laterals to shoot out, which will create even more flowers on there. What you don't want to do, maybe um, what they what they suggest and what I wouldn't recommend is doing that right before it rains, um, because the inside of the dahlia is likely to be hollow. And then if the water gets in there, there could be a chance that it might get to the tuber and then you might lose the plant, which you don't want to do. I've actually seen some people put those little tiki umbrellas in the holes, which is funny before the rain. Um, but once your plant gets about four or so sets of true leaves, so like one set would be here, one set, one set, one set, you want to cut off the top. It's hard to do. And then it'll shoot. Um, for some of the plants that I planted from tubers, if it was a tuber clump versus like a single tuber, um, the um, there's multiple shoots already. So I didn't really worry about can you give one? me one second? My yeah, dog. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. No, it's okay. She's an old lady and she just, um, when she decides she wants something, there's no, no set. <laughs> okay, so we, we were talking about um, Dahlia two about cutting off the Dahlia tubers or the Cutting off the tops of the dahlias. Yeah, the dahlia stems. Yeah, so if they're really thick, I mean, you're, the problem is, is if you're going to use them inside or for arrangements, you don't want a broomstick stem. I mean, that's too big. What kind of vase are you going to put in that with, with that, right? And so if you cut it, it encourages it to branch, which will be more manageable stems then um, in terms of the, the width of them. And so then you'll be able to arrange easier with them. So I went out there and... Give them a nice haircut from the top now, um, some of them, and then, um, you know, took those inside, uh, you know, threw them out with the, with the waste uh, that came this morning. But, um, you know, that should, you know, that should encourage more flowers. Now, what that does do, though, is it causes a bit of delay 
in the flowering, right? So if you can imagine that that's already been growing and it's ready, you know, this much more, now you cut off a foot of your plant, um, it's going to delay it a bit. They say it typically delays it by about a month. Um, but because I'm getting dahlia blooms so early right now, this is the earliest I've ever gotten dahlia blooms. I think I have four dahlias that have bloomed so far for me or are in the process of opening up, which I'm so excited about. Um, but because they're blooming so early for me, usually I wouldn't get dahlia blooms until at least end of July and definitely into August and September is when it booms. Um, so I said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do this trim now that it's so early in the season to encourage more flowers later on. You know, I, I had forgotten about that. I knew that they needed to be pinched and I didn't do that. And I thought mine had, were maybe beyond that point, but I'm thinking, no, I can still go out there and whack off the top of them. You can and even do it after they've flowered. Like that, sometimes people will do that, especially for new varieties to make sure that it blooms the correct variety. Um, you know, and then if not, they can contact their vendor and say, Hey, you gave me a yellow one instead of this pink one I wanted. Um, but you know, for me, I said, I, I mean, I've gone through a lot of great vendors this year, um, for, for my dollies, all small growers from the United States. So, uh, no imports, all, all kind of local, uh, more local in the States here. And so, um, I just decided to give them a trim. So we'll see if, if that works out to my advantage, but, uh, hoping for lots of time. I did it last year and it definitely worked. I mean, my dahlia uh, beds were just huge because they, like you said, they go out from wherever you trim them. So what what is your secret with um, like t digging up and, and tagging? I know that um, you're supposed to leave them out until after the first frost, until they kind of die back, but not till the first really bad for us like I did like frozen ground <laughs> so, so actually there's a lot of talk about when to pull dahlias and when it's okay to pull dahlias and it's actually people have different theories on it um okay so technically you don't have to wait until the first frost and I don't because I have so many but if I did that, I would be frozen outside like a snowman before the end of the digging season was up, right? As long as your dahlias have been in the ground for 120 days, and um, that gives it enough time to create new tubers and to, to get the, the energy back into the tubers, as long as they've been in the ground for 120 days, you should be okay then to dig it up. If you think about it, like places that plant in zone like 10 out in California, and they grow dahlias they never get a frost, right? So technically we don't really have to wait until a frost in order to dig them up. Now they say with the frost, it kind of hard coats the tuber almost to give it, um, you know, a bit more uh, protection in storage. Again, there's, there's different theories on there about what to do. What I typically do is um, once my dahlias look like they're starting to die back, um, and, and and maybe the cold weather is coming. I have to plant 4,000 tulip bulbs in these flower beds. So we got to get these things out, right? I'll start slowly digging up the ones that look like they're kind of done. They're starting to be done, right? Um, and then I'll work through the bed that way until I get the whole bed done. Now I have a process where when I plant the dahlia, I will document in a video and I will go around and I will say, okay, this is where this one is, this one is, this one is, and I tag everything with a waterproof outdoor marker um, to make sure that, oh, I can identify it. Now these tags are little and they're in the ground. So it's a little bit hard to see once these plants start growing tall, right? But the tag's always in the ground next to the tuber. So worst case, I can, you know, come out in the fall, cut it all down, and I'll be able to see what it was. Now, um, with my videoing, right, I'll do it after I plant it, and I'll do it progressively throughout the season to say, okay, this is what this one's looking like. These are the spots for them. And then eventually, when I have time, I'll create a map um, in Excel that shows me where each dahlia actually is. Um, I also got really good last year at recording down when each one bloomed. Um, and what did the bloom look like? Was it the correct variety, right? Because I have a spreadsheet that says all my varieties, where I got them from, uh, everything. Um, and so I grow over a hundred varieties of dahlias. Um, and so I like to keep track. Some are the more um, 
easy to find varieties. Some are the rare gems that a lot of these Dahlia war uh, folks go after, Dahlia aficionados, um, and they really want to um, find the rare ones, right? The ones that everybody is looking for, the ones that are hard to keep, maybe the ones that are hard to store become rare. So if you're spending $35 on a Dahlia tuber, you better bet that you're going to want to locate that thing after you, you tie it back, right? Um, so uh, you know, I try to stay pretty organized with it. And what really helps me a lot is taking pictures, taking videos. Um, on my phone, it's half kids, half flowers. <laughs> um, so that's my storage space on my phone right now. Uh, maybe a little bit more flowers now that they're really starting to, to come. But that's really how I keep track of my garden organization. And then, you know, if I have somebody asking me in January, hey, what kind of flowers do you think you'll have for a wedding end of June or end of July? I can go back and look at the pictures and the videos and say, ah, okay, I should have these, right? Um, and so it's very helpful to kind of plan for the next year, plan for colors, plan for what worked out well, what didn't work well, and maybe what changes to make for the next year. Um, and when you're dreaming over the winter, when it's nice and snowy outside, uh, it's fun to go back and look at all of that documentation. Yeah, I do the same thing. I keep a written journal of everything in my garden and how it grows each year, where I got things. And then I do use photographs and um, video too to figure out what I'm what I'm going to buy. And boy, in January, when those catalogs start coming, yeah, it's so much fun to be looking at all that stuff. So let's talk about your business a little bit because you're selling, I'm going to guess, to more like locally individual little shops do you deliver what what's what's what does that look like right now sure so I actually um just came off or, or just finishing up here our subscriptions so we offered spring subscriptions this year um and the way that we did our model this year was three months long and uh, an arrangement or a bouquet every month um, for our subscribers um, and that's just been fabulous. Um, it's been so much work for me to try to keep up for it, though, um, that I'm not offering subscriptions for this summer uh, to try to recover from that, <laughs> from that whole uh, that whole load. But it was a fantastic opportunity and and really great um, feedback from that. So we're definitely going to plan on bringing that back just in a different way next year. Um, so for the rest of this summer. Um, we're doing by order. Um, so uh, I can be contacted on Facebook or Instagram um, is my uh, preferred contact method. Um, and just to send me a message and say, hey, I'm interested in flowers. Or if you see something on my page that you're like, I must have those, right? Send me a message, right? I'll coordinate with you. I'll let you know if there's a wait list right for, um, for the flowers. Um, or if I have some already available, I'll let you know that too. Um, I also have people contact me ahead of time for events. Um, and so if you have a baptism coming up or a party coming up or something like that, right? Or if you have a wedding that's coming up in like September, which I have an opening for, I'd love to do a wedding in September. Um, but if, you know, somebody has an event coming up, they can contact me ahead of time and then we can kind of plan that out. And so really, um, you know, for me and how I'm running my business is, you know, when I go out, I'll pick a whole bunch of garden flowers, I'll make a whole bunch of arrangements or bouquets, and then whoever's on the wait list or ready to go, like, then I'll be contacting them down that list um, in order to uh, get flowers into their hands because they're fabulous. So um, that's how I'm currently handling my, my order intake and how to contact me. Um, there, I have run into a few people who have like these, almost like a food cart, but they're flower carts that they bring like to flea markets and different vendors like that and I I I make a beeline to those places because they have such fun things that I'm not able to grow in my garden or don't have the patience or the time and um, they must be doing well doing it because they come back year after year after year um, have you ever thought of doing something like that like a farmer's market or yeah, I have thought about that. And a couple of people have actually asked me like, hey, Catherine, we should have you at the Palatine Farmer's Market, right? Mm -hmm. And while I don't want to say it's 
it's never going to be a possibility, right? Because you never know what, what my model might be in the future. Right now, due to the number of flowers that I grow and the space that I grow in, I only have so much flowers, right? So um, there are so many flowers. And so those flowers go to direct orders. I'm so, I'm so lucky and fortunate to have a backlog of wait lists and direct orders that um, I actually don't have any other flowers left for a farmer's market. Um, so I, but I do have other um, friends who do flower farming in the surrounding suburbs where their models are farmer's markets, right? Or they do subscriptions only full-time. Um, there's actually a place out in Barrington that does a U-pick. So you can swing by them and pick your own flowers, right? So um, there's just a lot of local businesses out there um, that are doing things similar that might be around your corner and you don't even know it. Um, so Instagram, Facebook have been very powerful to, to introduce me to them. Um, and so, you know, if, if you Lynn or, you know, your subscribers and your, your, uh, your friends watching, uh, the podcast here, if they're interested in finding somebody more local to them, um, have them reach out to me. Um, cause I have, uh, made a lot of friends in this journey. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed that I, um, I kind of scrolled through who you follow and who follows you and, and social media, a lot of different, a lot of flower people that I wasn't. I wasn't aware of. So we talked a little bit about weddings. Um, like I told you that Annie had her wedding in our backyard and I knew I would never produce enough flowers to do a wedding. So we ordered from um, a rather well-known flower company that I, I'm, I'm not gonna eat, say the name, but um, the flowers came and they were pretty much mush when they got to us. Yeah, it was it was bad. And here we are two days before a wedding with very little to work with. And um, I got really lucky with Trader Joe's. Had I known you at the time, <laughs> yeah, I would have been over at your house begging. <laughs> but um, yeah, we, we made do, but it was it was a little crazy. So something using somebody like you for a wedding, one, it adds that personal touch that I don't think you get with your average florist or with the company like we chose to, they, they, they advertise the most beautiful flowers. So we thought we were, you know, going the, in the right direction. Oh, yeah. But um, what a fun thing to have somebody local, somebody in your backyard who's growing flowers just for you. Um, it sounds like you enjoy weddings. Is that something you really would like to maybe grow a little bit? Definitely. I've been really fortunate to have had three brides in the last two years reach out to me and ask me if I do weddings, if I could do their floral bouquets uh, and their bridal bouquets. And honestly, never in a million years would I have trusted myself to, you know, create something for them for their wedding day. Because everybody wants, you know, their, their wedding day to be perfect, right? Everything to, to work out and be perfect. And for a bride to trust me to deliver on their flowers is just, um, it's incredible. It, it, it's, I'm honored um, that somebody would do that. And so the way that I, um, there's a lot of planning that's involved that I don't think people realize um, when it comes to weddings, right? Like what, what kind of ties do you want? What kind of ribbons do you want? You know, what kind of look are you going for? Do you want something very colorful or very muted? And I've been starting to learn a lot about weddings. I just did a recent wedding um, this a uh, couple of weeks ago for two brides. Um, so it was a it was a wedding um, with two brides, two bridal bouquets, and that was fun to try to figure mm -hmm. out. You know, how do these ladies? want their flowers to look do we do we have them both be the same do we have them both be different do we have them be a mix of the a blend of the two and um they loved it they they were just so happy with the flowers and um i'm i'm fortunate enough to have known one of the brides um from uh from dance years ago and she said one of the first things she knew is who she wanted to do the flowers, which again, is just an honor to even yeah. be in 
category where somebody would consider you for something like that. So um, for my brides, you know, I, I love to work with a bride again um, later this year or even next year. I'm in a conversation with a few people already and doing bridal party flowers, um, the boutonnieres, the corsages, the bouquets. Um, if there are special requests, like we had a bride who really wanted ro uh, roses. I don't grow roses like that, right? For, that they would need, the number that they would need. So I, I do order flowers if needed. Um, there was another bride who loved carnations, right? I don't grow carnations. So we had to order carnations. So if there's special requests from brides or it's not like I'm going to say no, um, no, I can't do that at all, right? Um, or not come up with alternate options. But um, it was, it turned out really beautiful. And looking at how the flowers really elevate a wedding is incredible. Um, the bridesmaids dresses were navy. The brides were wearing like an ivory off-white collar. And just having bright florals against those just brought the wedding to a new level. And here I am sitting in the back, not only crying because, you know, the brides are beautiful and it's just a beautiful day, but I'm looking at the flowers going, I did that. I made those flowers and look at how beautiful they look for this special day for them. So um, again, it's, you know, it's something that I'm very interested in continuing to learn about um, continuing to perfect. And uh, as you mentioned earlier, I'm not formally trained, right? I, I get all of my training from watching videos, uh, shadowing experts, talking to people, asking questions, right? Being inquisitive, you know, uh, researching, on, you know, at three in the morning on how to, how to do this, right? And so um, for me, it's all about the learning process and the journey. Um, and the more I uh, research, the more I know, and, and the more that I learn how to perfect a skill. So um, I'm just starting to dip into weddings, but um, excited for the opportunities to come. Yeah. I, I mean, there's something about flowers, whether it's for an ordinary day or for a wedding, that just makes you smile and makes everything special. So um as we wrap this up, I I always ask my guests a few questions. Um, one of them I'm gonna I'm gonna pass over, and here's the reason why. It was what are your other hobbies and interests? And now that I know that you work a full time job, have small children, that and do this all by, and are a one man show Please for this flower. <laughs> I don't think you have time for anything else. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pressure you into trying to think of something. But tell me what your favorite time of day is in the garden, because I have a, a preference. I wondered if you did too. So my favorite time of day is in the early evening when the sun is setting. And we've had some beautiful sunsets here lately. It's not mm -hmm. so hot, sun's not blaring on you. And the flowers actually take up a different color in different lighting. And so when I take pictures of the same flower during the day and then at dusk, it's incredible. And I think when the sun kind of goes down a bit, it makes everything softer, it makes you kind of breathe that the day is done and, um, you know, it's ending. And I just, that's my favorite time. And I'm the opposite. I like, like I was out in the garden at six o'clock this morning and I like that early morning where there's still maybe some dew on the petals and, you know, I've got my cup of coffee in my hand and it's so quiet. There's nobody around. And that's when I like to be. You've got there. your coffee. I've got my glass of wine. Yeah. <laughs> we, can, we can switch that up. <laughs> so another thing I always ask everybody is what's something about you that nobody knows or that most people don't know? So I have been a tap dancer for over 25 years. Um, and it's a great form of exercise. I love it. I'm in an adult tap class. We perform on stage. And if you can't, couldn't tell already, I'm pretty personable and, and, and love, you know, um, kind of the spotlight. And so for me, it's it's super fun and it's something I could do for me. 
Um, my daughter started tap dancing this year, my older daughter too. So now I get to do it with her and the younger one tr was trying on the shoes. So I think she's, you know, going to follow in our footsteps. So hopefully we'll be a, a little tapping family over here eventually. Where do you dance at? Um, so I actually go to KB Dance. Um, they do classes out of Harper and their private studio um, that just got started up about a year or two ago. And um, they're fantastic. There's an adult class that has about 20 or so ladies in it um, in, in, a, in a range of ages and skills. And um, it's just, it's really a community and they're really a fun, a fun group to be a part of. So we all encourage each other and we all have a lot of fun doing it. So you do have another hobby outside. <laughs> I do actually, there you go. <laughs> Besides... my, youngest, my youngest daughter danced her, her whole childhood. And she gave it up when she went off to college. And I was always sad about that, like that she didn't continue it even not as a profession, but just as a hobby um, for some, cause she was good. And she was in um, pre-professional dance um, classes oh, when she awesome. quit. Yeah. It's yeah. She was exercise when you're an adult too. And there's a lot of programs out there that I've noticed. I mean, I also, um, I'm looking to take up a Zumba class eventually kind of get my cardio going a little bit more. And I think it's maybe, you know, now that my kids are um, a little older, they're not babies anymore. Um, and so uh, I can kind of step away from the house for an hour and it's okay, you know, and, and mama can get a, get a workout in. So besides being in the garden and doing lots of squats, you know, get, getting, getting a, a real burn from doing gardening, um, that cardio for me has been really uh, good uh, from a healthy healthiness perspective as well. So I love it. I think it's so fun. It is. That is very, very fun. So I want to thank you for being on my podcast. I can't wait to meet you in person. I'm sure that we are paths that have bound across at least sometime soon, hopefully sooner than later. And I also want to thank all my listeners. And I hope you enjoyed this episode with Catherine. Awesome. Thanks, Lynn. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you so much.